Rocha, and today I'm talking with Jeff Hopkins, author of fiction, fact, faction, and fantasy. Join me as we learn about Jeff's creative journey and where he gets his ideas from. G'day, Jeff. Thanks for joining me. Lovely no. to meet you. Well, it's no problem. And we're up to, you've done 15 books with us over the last um, six or seven years or so. Um, 15 books is an awful lot in anyone's category and you've still got more to come. And we're Well, still I sent one. an email to uh, Astrid this morning uh, with all the corrections for Creatively. There were only 10 or so, which that's is great. excellent, which is excellent for a first yep. draft. Yeah, that's awesome. So, yes, we're on our way for the 16th book. Wow. So you haven't been retired that long. Where on earth did you get time to write 16 books? And, and 17, I think, isn't it? You've got one more still to come after this. Two more course. next year. Two more. Yeah, one in the first half, one in the second half of next year. Where do, I retired in 2006 at age uh, 56, and I've been retired 15 years, and I didn't start writing the books until 2015, and that's when you published Artifice for the first time in 2015 in May. So we've really only been publish self-publishing with Indimosh for six years. Six years, yeah. Yeah, wow. But there'd, there'd been a lot of them on the desktop as manuscripts that just got rewritten and rewritten and finally joined the queue. And I, it has been a funny queue because things have been promoted and things have been dismissed and, and switched around. But uh, we've got the last three in order now. Creatively will come out probably later this month. Surviving the Silence, first half of next year, and the geneolo genealogy study, which is called Life's Race Well Run, which I actually wrote in 1992. So it's a 30-year 30 30 gestation. Wow. wow. But it had to be rewritten because there's so much new information. And yeah. it will be a sort of a, a completing the circle and a full stop. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, is it is it like a, a bit of a drug? The writing, like 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 you do it when you when you finish one. Does that make room in your head for more to come in? I describe it as an addiction, yeah. but a very good addiction, and I'm sure it comes from writing the eleven original musicals from the 1980s. When as soon as I finished one, usually they were produced and presented at school in the May or the June. I would start writing the next one straight away to give time for the composers to compose the score so that we could be in rehearsal in February for the next May or June. So that's what's happening with the books. Right. And yeah. so many of the books are spawned by ideas in one that lead to a book in the next one. I'll give you an example. In Signs, the sequel to Handsome Jack, the race racing story, the little uh, Indigenous boy reads the story of Alarak Pindabore, who whose name is given to the boarding house that he's staying at at Aquinas College. And, of course, when I read that biography, I thought, my hat, this is some guy. Yeah. And so I researched him. I do a lot of research. I researched him just to find out who he really was. And when I found the true story, I just thought, wow, this is a book. Here we go. And I wrote it, and that sort of sparked off the faction stuff, you know, the fiction based on fact. And that's my new um, preferred genre. I love writing fiction based on fact because you can, you can dress it up with real information from a real world and then just put in those little conversations in fiction that, you know, expand on the character. It's sort of like entertainment with education, isn't it? I'm sure it's like that. I'm yeah. sure it's like that. Yeah. But it's a great genre to work in. Yeah. Uh, the best genres to work in, and most of your authors at Indymosh will know this, is fantasy. Yes. Because yeah. you create the world, you create the rules, you create the characters, and you can do what you like with them. You can kill them off or you can, you can make them heroes or villains or whatever you like. And, of course, that's, that was the motivation for writing the three books in the Nile series, Nile, Lord Nile and Caliphs and Kings. Just beautiful, easy writing. I, I wanted to ask you about that. Like, 
I mean, I read The Spiv, that was one of your early ones, and and a lot of your other books sort of have that same quintessential Australian story, um, you know, like Handsome Jack, things like that. So there's there's that sort of, of writing. And then you do Now, which is just so different to, to me, to well, everything Nile else. Well, came before them. Oh, okay. Yeah, Artifice was first. That's the schoolboy story about the art teacher. Yeah. Then came Nile. Yeah. Now, Nile was almost straight after Artifice, and okay. Lord Nile came almost immediately afterwards, but it was delayed five years because it just sat on the desktop. And when I finally got around to writing the third book in the trilogy, I thought, this second book is no good because I've done things in the third book which are much richer and much more interesting. So I went back and rewrote the second one and promoted characters from the third one into the second one to give it a, a nicer connection. And I'm sure it's a better trilogy as a result of that. So the Nile trilogy was written over five years, although right. the first one came out very early. So it was almost written at either end of the five years. In That's essence. correct. That's how it was done. Yeah. It, yeah. You know, so you, when I finish something, I always put it, on the desktop and leave it for about three months or, or sometimes a year before I even contemplate sending it to you. Because when you get back to it and start re-editing, you think, no, that isn't good enough. This has to be rewritten and reworked. And I think that's a, that's a message that all your authors will understand, that you don't whack a manuscript down and publish it just like that. It takes a lot of reworking. Yeah, Stephen King says that in On Writing. He says you finish, he says you type the end, and he said then you put it away and you go and do something else. That's correct. He says start the next one, then come back to it. But yes, That's the way I do it, yeah. yeah. You yeah. were saying that all my stories were Australian, and of course they are. Most, yeah. yeah. And a lot of them are autobiographical, although I'm disguised. You know, in the SPIV, I'm a sports commentator called Lumpy. <laughs> in... In Impressment, which is set in the first years of the 17th century, you know, 1601, in the Blackfriars Theatre, I'm actually playing one of the managers of the theatre because the lessons that I conduct with the impressed boys on the stage are just lessons I did while I was a drama master at Hale School. Oh, right. So I'm actually playing the role in those. But when we got to Rocking Horse Rider, do you remember that? Yes, yes. That's when I changed direction and I thought, well, none of these books are selling very well in America or England or Germany or wherever. What about I write something international? So I wrote Rocking Horse Rider and started it off in London, yep. took it to Paris, That's wrote right, some yeah. sections of it in French, if you remember. That's right, yeah. And then got it back to Australia. And of course, once I'd done that and it sold a few copies, mm -hmm. I thought this needs a prequel. And I'd never written a prequel before. So I took it back um, nearly a hundred years and told the story of how the people who were in Rocking Horse Rider, well, who their ancestors were and how Summerhaven mm -hmm. Park was built. And mm -hmm. the hydrographer, do you remember we put it on free release in the Smashwords? Um, you probably don't because you deal with so many hundreds of books. But we put the hydrographer on on free release on Smashwords. Yeah. Absolutely took off. Right. They downloaded 437 copies of it. Wow. And then we put it back at 299 and it stopped. <laughs> they, <laughs> they were prepared to read at nothing. But, but they, nothing, yeah. But they wouldn't read at 299. So yeah. those two books, I call them experimental because mm. they were trying to be international stories. Yeah. And, of course, once they were, were done, I came back to the Australian stories of Handsome Jack and Signs, yeah. etc. Yeah. And is that what you enjoy writing, the Australian? Or it's it's easy. Like fantasy? I, I know the Australian stories. You see, Handsome Jack is... My father was a bookmaker for 30 years. And Hanson, really? Yeah. And, and he told me – and I used to go to the races with him. I even clerked for him towards the end of his career, you know, oh, penciled. Okay. Yeah. And um, he told me some of those hair-raising stories from the 1930s when drugs were rife and the fix was in and all these horrible things were happening in horse racing. And I just collected them all up in my head. And when I started writing Handsome Jack, I gave all those racing scams, as I called them, 
to Ray Ratcliffe, the trainer, who was a very naughty boy and became quite an evil character. And by the end of it, I thought, Jeff, what have you done? You've created a monster. So I had to write signs to give him a chance to come back from perdition to redemption. Redeem and he comes really. out as a really good character in the second book. And the way he deals with that Indigenous boy in that book to give him so many opportunities in life, I really liked. But then again, you know, I'm writing for me. <laughs> I've got to enjoy the book. If I can't yeah, enjoy it, I throw it away. Yeah, I think you have to to a point because if you don't enjoy it, if you if you do it to a formula, if you do it, um, if you thin it out to try and pitch it, I mean, sure, you've got to know who your market is, but if you write what you think people are expecting to read, it becomes thin. It doesn't have the it doesn't have the feeling. It doesn't have the yeah. Yeah. Well, when I set out. My original plan was to write in as many different genres as I could. So, you know, there is there are novels that are based on personal experiences. There's three books of fantasy. There's three books in the faction uh, series. And then, of course, there's um, the memoir, which is coming out this month, which sort of tells all the backstories to, to how the plays were written in the 80s and how the books were written you know, after I retired. So you were you were writing plays in the eighties, musicals. Musicals, yeah. What was the first thing you ever wrote, and when was that? The very first thing I ever wrote. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you'd have to go back to nineteen fifty nine. I'm in grade five, uh -huh. and I write a play called Kindness Pays, and our teacher allows me to produce it in the front of the class with other kids and he even writes on the bottom of my mid-year report he puts in a category writing plays jeff devotes his time to writing plays so that was sort of 1959 in the 60s i was doing a lot of performing on stage in various uh, theater groups and at school but i was also writing film scripts because i'd started making films and they were lame and amateur sort of things, but they were scripts for movies. Yeah. And once I got to my first teaching appointment in 1972 at Northern Senior High School, I started writing serious film scripts. Right. And I wrote a thing in 1972 called Traces, which was about a boy having trouble in a boarding house who eventually suicided. It was a very difficult Ooh. subject for that time. Yeah, dark. Yeah. Entered it in the Channel 7 young filmmakers competition and won. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah, we got a whole heap of filmmaking equipment for the high school and then we were away. And so we made another one at the end of that year called The Cadets, which was based on um, the last... Do you last... still have copies of these? Oh, yeah, they're all on DVD now. Oh, good, good. You don't want and to lose that. No, I had them copied from Super 8 to DVD a few years ago. Some of them stand up pretty well. Yeah. In 73, I made two movies. One was called Suzanne, and here's a recurring theme that's going to come up a lot, based on on songs by Neil Diamond, an okay. unrequited love story where the two young actors catch the ferry to Rotnest and have an idyllic day together. But at the end, we get the twist because he's sitting in the rain on a bus stop and she's across the road under her umbrella and they've never actually met. Oh, right. That was entered in the Young Filmmakers Competition and we won again two years in a row. Thank you very much. Well done. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> so that was filmmaking at Northam and that was scripting. And then I was producing yeah. plays at the same time as Northam because they wanted me to do that sort of thing. Yeah. Then I went to the Geelong College in uh, Geelong in Victoria and I was writing musicals for the boys in the first year because it was an all-boys school and then the boys and girls in the second year because they went co-ed. So I wrote a thing called Home for Urchin Boys in 1974 and in 75 I wrote a musical called Jonathan based on Richard Bach's novel Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where we didn't have seagulls, we had boys and girls. And that was performed around the swimming pool at, um, at the John College Preparatory School and later in the year... I did another thing called Billy Budd based on the 
um, Herman Melville short story. Ben- Benjamin Britten had written an opera, but it was unsuitable for kids of that age. So I wrote this story and I put in traditional traditional songs and music to make the musical, and that's the way we did it. Then we went down to Point Addis, which is like Bell's Beach in, in uh, Victoria, and made a film of the Jonathan story using the cliffs and the beach and the surf, and that worked out really well. Then I went to Toowoomba Grammar in 1977 and produced a play there, and then I came back to... Um, Perth after four years being in the Eastern States and went to Guildford Grammar School, which Guildford just dominates my writing. You know, there are two books. Um, Reflections is based at Guildford and so is the Gavin Johns story when Guildford is evacuated to Fairbridge Farm School. Right. Then I got headhunted to Hale School as their drama master and that began the 11 original musicals. Right. Wow. Wow. We started with the Roundhouse, which just had traditional music. Then we did seven Neil Diamond songs in a thing called Brother Love's Travelling Salvation Show, which are a real hoot. Yeah, that and would in, have been great fun. In nine, oh, the people who loved Neil Diamond loved yeah. that show. Yeah. Then in 1984, I said to the musical director, Bernard Harvey, what about we write an original musical? Yeah. Original lyrics, original music, the full works. And he said, look, I'll sound out Billy Stewart, who was in the West Australian Symphony Orchestra. He, lo- he likes composing. We'll see if we can get him to come on board. Well, it doubled the budget because Bill had to be paid. <laughs> Dang. But we decided, and this was interesting, we decided very early to write the lyrics first and make the lyrics carry part of the story in the musical. Now, that was tricky. So I was given the task of writing all the lyrics first and then I gave them to Bill Stewart. I'll tell you a funny story. We went to lunch together and we're sitting at lunch and I said, I think I've got the first song. It's the title song, Reflections. And Bill said, yes, what are the words? So he picks up a pen and writes on the back of a paper napkin the words of reflections that I've written. And then he turns around to the upright piano, which was in the dining room of the house we're having lunch at, and he plays a few chords And then he sings the song exactly how it turned out in the musical six months later. And he turns to me and says, well, that's the first one. When do I get the rest? (laughs) And that's how it went on for 11 11 years. Wow. And um, Bill did other things uh, at various stages and so couldn't compose the musical. So we had Jeff Carroll do two. And then Raymond Long, who happened to be the musical director for Shirley Bassey, composed the music for a thing called Fleance towards the end of the whole thing. And only last week, after 30 years, I managed to track down Bill Stewart. Never saw him after the musicals. He's in Ballarat and he's retired and he's done teaching and music teaching. And we had a wonderful telephone conversation. You know, when you meet somebody after 30 years, memories just are like yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. doing a lot of talking, Jenny. I need no, you to ask me some more questions. That's, that's the idea, Jeff. Yeah. So I'm just done. You've just had this life full of stuff that you've been bringing out in one way or another, one creative way or another, yep. um, whether it's a book or a musical. So I'm curious with the filmmaking, do you see any of your books as films? Could you see them as films? Have you not been tempted to write? My to, friends to say that of? the books are very visual. And I think that comes from filmmaking, scripting films, because you're always looking from the point of view of the camera and you want to see what's happening from the point of view of the camera. And you just naturally write in the same way in the books. And so, you know, a thing like the Spiv, which is a wonderful story about a man who had wonderful experiences, would make a great film. And I think Handsome Jack would make a a fantastic film as well with all the racing and the colour that you could bring to the story in that way. So, yeah, Yeah. to to answer your question, it has been said to me, you know, you write visually, Jeff. They they read like you're you're seeing it. And I am. Yeah. Of course, writing the books is much, much easier than making a film or directing a musical. You need no sets. You need no cast. (laughs) It costs nothing except for the publication later. But, but, you know, you're in total control Control. and you don't – sometimes when you're writing a musical, you Mm. think, 
oh, I can't include that. It'd just be too hard to stage. Or, or is yeah. there an actor in the school who could possibly play this part? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, if you want someone who's a certain physicality or something in a in a book, that doesn't matter. You can, yeah. Well, it happened be two twice. and a half metres tall or something. Well, it happened twice in 1985 and 1987. In 1985, one of the boys who was playing a sealer in a Seal Island band, his name was, the character's name was Tom Elder. We'd done two nights of the run last night, Saturday night. I'm home having an afternoon nap, getting ready for the evening. Telephone rings. Andrew Chitty playing Tom Elder has broken his leg. How? He's in hospital, playing hockey in Saturday morning sport. He's in hospital having it put in a plaster cast. Phone goes dead. Jeff is dumbfounded. And then I said calmly to the person who rang, I think it was the musical director who rang me. Mm -hmm. I said calmly to him, look, no problems, Bernard. Uh, I'll play Tom Elder tonight. He said, are you sure? I said, yes. And when I put the phone down, I thought, what in heaven's name have you done? So I immediately drove to Hale School and got the other lead actor who who did scenes with Tom Elder, and we worked for about an hour and a half on the stage going through moves. He was a very clever boy. And uh, then I went upstairs, tried to learn the rest of the script, which I had written and couldn't remember a single word. <laughs> I suppose I tried, once you write it too... And you it's, just let it go. It's gone. You, you've got to let it go. Yeah. So anyhow, um, showtime came round... Bernard went out through the curtains, announced that I was playing Tom Elder in tonight's performance, which I didn't think was really necessary. I carried a small bottle of brandy around in my costume pocket and swigged it throughout, and we got through. And I was so enchanted by the experience that in 1987, I wrote a part for myself in a thing called Google One, The Place of Trees. So what was the first word? Google One. It's an (gasps) Aboriginal word that means the place of trees. Right. His name was Cartland Couture, and he was a fashion designer supreme. And I wrote a song for him, and I made the costume, which was absolutely outrageous, sort of a jumpsuit in cerise with matching hat and shoes. Oh, it sounds like my kind of clothing. (laughs) He appeared in one scene where he had to dress two members of the board of Alchemy International in drag so that they could pull off a con trick with the uh-huh. Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, and it was just 10 minutes of absolute joy. Yeah. I've never done anything since. I've never been on the stage again ever since oh. Cartland Couture. In fact, I introduced the Cartland Couture Award at the same time, and I believe it is still the award given to the best actor in the school musical. And they don't know who Cartland Couture is because he never appeared. Whenever the award was presented, I had to present it on his behalf, saying oh, he was okay. on So. In the first year, it was a joke. In the second year, kids looked and thought, who is this Carlin? Sure. <laughs> Anyhow, that, that's performance. Tom yeah. Elder with a, yeah. for a kid who broke his leg and Cartland Couture because I was ego tripping, Jenny. I was ego tripping. <laughs> oh, we've got to have a little bit sometime in our lives. Just um, 10 minutes. <laughs> have, you, have you ever thought about writing the Cartland Couture story? Oh, Could that uh, be fun? The, the true story of Cartland Couture, Cartland Couture? <laughs> or the imagined story of Cartland Couture? Or the imagined story? Yeah. Well, if you've things, seen things on Netflix like Halston or yes, Gianni Versace, it. yep. the G- Gianni Versace story, fashion designers are absolutely fabulous people, but it'd have to be a comedy piece. Yes. It'd yeah. have to be a nutty comedy piece about a con man. Yeah. The story would be something like a con man from humble beginnings stumbles into a fashion boutique and impersonates somebody and pulls it off with a couple of great designs and then you'd take it from there. That's how a story like that would develop, I think. Oh, okay. No plans, Jenny. That was was interesting. You just just came out with that then? Like that's how it would happen? That's how it happens. Wow. In Artifice, I was... I was writing my own story because I was in Canberra teaching with the Commonwealth Teaching Service and I went down to Threadbow and uh, I read in the newspaper two ads for positions in Albury and Geelong and I wrote applications for them and I went to Albury, did an interview, didn't like it, but I accepted the job in Geelong, which was Mm -hmm. fabulous and I stayed there for, for three years. 
but uh, that is the story I gave to Fiona Beaumont, the the art teacher in Artifice. Yes. So her, the first chapter of her experience coming back to Sydney, having had a failed affair in Paris, and then going to Threadbow and reading the newspapers and applying for the job in July. That's my story. And that's how, how I was telling you how a lot of things in my books are autobiographical, disguised in yeah. other people. Yeah. So, you know. That's that's how it happens. Right. It's all ego tripping, Jenny. Yeah. It's all ego. Vanity publishing, <laughs> as no, no, you no, call no, it. Vanity. No, no, no. No, no. Never call it vanity. Which leads us to legacy publishing, which yeah. is the latest thing. Yeah. I really believe mm -hmm. that people's stories have to be written and published or they're lost. Yes, they Look are. Look at that magnificent musical director I had at Hale for 11 years who, who done the, did the musical direction for all those plays and was just, in his way, yeah. a genius. Yeah. He died at 44, two years after the musicals ended. Now, 1994, 16, it's, it's more than 27 years. Yeah. yeah, 27 years. Nobody would know his story. No. No one sad. would know that he gathered up all those musical instruments at... Hale School and and made them work again. He valued the collection of instruments that he was giving to the kids at a million dollars. Nobody knew it. Yeah. So I've written it in creatively. I've given him, you know, two or three chapters in creatively about his story and he lives. Yeah. And that's what I call legacy publishing, I think. Yeah. And I would encourage, you know, I, I sometimes see on your Indie Mosh feed stories from people who are reporting on their life in the rag trade or, or their life in a particular occupation or the journey they made around Australia as grey nomads. Yeah. That is legacy publishing. Yeah. That is leaving something behind for the people who someday in the future might want to know what X and Y and Z did in their life and you've left them something to start with. Exactly. I, I believe in those stories on the grounds that... This we're we're in great times where ordinary people like us can do that. We can leave that historical record. I mean, we we carry and out it can come out deposit. in a beautifully published That's book. That's it. And but we lodge it with the National Library, so there's a copy there forever. And it's the people's voice. It's not the official record. It's the people's voice. So for future researchers, I think it provides a lot more colour and detail and probably truth than the official records might. And it doesn't matter a frig that it never sells a copy. Exactly. Because yeah. you take your 10 complimentary copies, or yep. now my birthday book list has grown to about 20, so I have to buy 10 extra as <laughs> well as the 10 <laughs> complimentary. And you send Stop them making out, friends, Jeff. And, and you send them out to people. And, you know, you get a lovely phone call or you get a nice card that says, thank you very much for that story, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And you think, all worthwhile, yeah. all worthwhile. Legacy publishing. Yeah, good on you. I like that term. <laughs> Putting in might, your next book. <laughs> I'll have to. You'll have to. Yeah, have to coin that phrase. Yeah, legacy publishing. Yeah. Curtis, copyright Jeff Hopkins. No, 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 no. It's free. It's like <laughs> it's, free. it's like the books I send to people. They're all free. They're all free. Some of them try to shove fifty dollar notes into my hand and say they must pay for it. I said no. If oh well, it's it's the gift. Yeah. And I I tell you what the biggest gift of all is. Yeah. When you get an email from Smashwords to say that somebody you've never heard of has downloaded your book, or 20 yeah. people have, yeah. or you get a notification from you at IndieMosh to say that somebody in Germany yeah. bought Handsome Jack, and yeah. you wonder, my hat, what is a German thinking about this? Yes. And yeah. they're the thrills. They yeah. are the absolute thrills, you know. Um, Professor Geoffrey Blaney, who's written a lot of books on history in Australia, Tyranny of Distance, has recently come out with a memoir and he said, if you sell six books, you're a success. So that's good, isn't it? Really? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Six. Six. And of course, Tyranny of Distance sold millions of copies, but yeah. that yeah. was his view that <laughs> six was enough. Six. You yeah. touched enough people. I suppose so. Um, yeah, you touch six lives and yeah. And in some cases, you know, somebody who's read it passes it on to their friend who gives it to their dentist, who gives it to their it's dentist's wife, else. and suddenly you get a phone call saying, can we have a copy of this book because we want to give it to X 
for a birthday present and we'll be paying for it. Yeah. yeah. And That's so cool. on and so forth. Some people have a thing about people lending books. They say it's not right. They should buy one. But lending is free marketing because somewhere along that line, if the book is any good, people aren't going to keep lending it. They're going to buy it they as a gift for somebody yeah. or they're going to say to someone, you've got to get a copy of this book. Exactly. So, yeah, lending is, yeah, I don't have a problem with it. And that may happen over a long period of time. Now, exactly. I'm in my yeah. sixth year of publishing yeah. and I think the record shows we're about to hit our 400th sale. Wow. That doesn't matter to me. Yeah. Yeah. Because I would have, <laughs> I would have given away another two hundred yeah. to people yeah. who've read the stuff, yeah. and you know what it is about a writer. If a writer is not read, they're not a writer. No. <laughs> if you no. can't get somebody to read the material, you're yeah. not a writer. That's right, and it doesn't have to necessarily be millions. It's got to be people that, yeah, are happy to read it. Um, Yes, I think I'd rather have a lesser number of people who are really interested than having millions of people buy it and not really care. Correct. It's, um, yeah, a smaller number that value it is probably better, isn't it? I've just sent Astrid an email, mm -hmm. and at the bottom I've given a quote from the Charles Dickens Museum in England. It's called Quote of the Month, uh -huh. and it comes from Oliver Twist. And Dickens says, oh, no, we're not going to make a writer of you now while there's still a good trade to be learned. <laughs> I thought that was very funny. That's gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> That's Charles Dickens. I like Charles Dickens. Look, he was good. He was good. <laughs> <laughs> only lived to be 58. Did he really? Yeah. Mind you, when was that? 1700s? No, no, no. 18, uh, 18, mm. 1870 he died. At mm. 58. Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad for that, that period of time. Um, Crammed a lot of stuff into his life, I might tell you, including a 20-year affair with his mistress. Did he? <laughs> he, had, he had 11 children with his wife. Yeah. And then... In, she and, was probably glad for the mistress after 11 children. <laughs> and simultaneously, he had three children with this mistress. It's a wonderful story. It's been made into a film called The Other Woman. And it would never have been discovered, except they were coming back from France where they had their love nest. Yeah. And they were on the Stockton Railway and it crashed. And they were rescued from the crash. And there he was, <laughs> injured in the arms of his mistress. Oh, wow. Lovely Charles Dickens story. Wow. Gee, so 14 children? 14 children all up, yeah, with Gee, his, one, his wife. Wonder where their descendants are today. They're everywhere, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wouldn't that be a buzz? With modern, like, DNA testing and everything, to be able to say, I'm a descendant of Charles Dickens. Ancestry.com, myheritage.com, they would yeah. all fill in the details for you. They would. They probably would. I use yeah. those tremendous. I know you're interested in genealogy yeah. as well. I yeah. use those a lot, particularly in the faction books where you're trying to write a genuine genealogy for a factual character. Yeah. But occasionally I'm really, really naughty and I write a fictional genealogy for a person who never really existed. And, and we had great fun with that in Alaric Pindabore where – do you remember the painting on the back of the ballet dancer or the gymnast? Yes, yes. Right. I, the bloke at What's a Portrait who painted that signed it, KG. And I was going to say to Ali, take that off. Get rid of that KG. We don't want that. And then I thought, ah, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to invent KG. All right. So, so I invented this character called Kieran Guilfoyle, who was a peer at CBC with Alaric Pindabor and painted the picture as part of an Arts Day project. And do you know, people questioned me about it. They looked up, they tried to find here in Guildford. We can't find him anywhere in the historical record, Jeff. And I said, oh, can't you? Oh, well, these things happen. <laughs> <laughs> My research is better than yours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's naughty writing because oh, you're having a bit of fun. But it's faction. It's so faction, it's absolutely. Faction. Yeah. Right, so we're looking at publishing creatively now. We're yes. working on that. Yes. Um, you're working on that with Astrid now. Yes. Um, and Ali is doing the um, 
the pictures. Yep. I haven't seen anything from Ali yet, but she's got a choice between photographics and paintings. And the paintings, that's right. Yep. Both the same. So yep. we should see something in the near future. Okay. And, you know, yep. I, I think that'll be out by the end of July because I did the corrections well, over yeah, the weekend. Six of July. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. There are only 10. Yeah, that's Ten great. Ten corrections in 100,000 words. That's pretty good, really. That is pretty good, yeah. yeah Mind you, I do 10 drafts now. That's a rule. You must do 10 drafts of the manuscript before you yeah. send it to Indy Mosh. That Because every draft you're doing is like a correction session yeah. on Indy Mosh, isn't it? And if you can get all the corrections right yeah. before you send it, then you limit the number of corrections that have to be made in the what do you As call the working. internals in the work? Yeah, in the, in the internal, of, yeah. 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 Um, and the other thing is too, you you really want to be happy with what you're sending before you send it off. Absolutely. Otherwise, you look um, a dope. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> and especially the big stuff. Like if you, if you haven't got your storyline right, if you haven't got your characters developed properly, you know, we don't want to be laying out a, a manuscript and then having to be making major changes, you know. Correct. A, 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 a typo here, you, you know, there's, even if you've had, had it structurally edited, copy edited and proofread, there are still going to be things that get missed. It, it happens in, even in, you know, traditional publishing. And occasionally you get an incident like I had last week with Bill Stewart. He gave me a little bit of extra information about Peter Taplin, who I was writing about in Creatively, and I was able to send that to Astrid to say, can you just put this extra sentence in at this point as an insertion? So, you know, that wasn't a correction. That was an insertion that came yeah. from later information. And occasionally that happens. Yeah. More often than not, the information comes through after the book is published. Yeah. And you think, oh, gee, that's rotten. Yeah. But <laughs> it happens. Mind you... In this day and age, with the way this sort of publishing's done, if it's if it's really important, those files can be updated. Right. So that is that is another thought. I mean, yep. yes, it's expensive because it's yep. you're redoing Doing the book again. It. But if it was that important, it can be done. You know. Um, well, in the particular case I'm thinking of, where I lost a sister, four mm. sisters existed, and I only had three. And right. the last sister turned up after the book had been published. I was really, you know, grit your teeth, grind them, angry. Yeah. And yeah. then I thought, no, let it go. Yeah. We're moving on. We've got other things to do. Yeah. Yeah, you have to. It's, um, yeah, it's knowing knowing what to hold and what to... Knowing when to fold them. Hold them. Knowing yep. when to yep. hold them. No, when to <laughs> knowing fold when them. to walk away. Yep, exactly. Good on you, Kenny. <laughs> Kenny, Kenny Rogers. Rogers. Yep, that's yeah. right. Yep, yeah. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Well, I think, well, that's you have done so much. Um, do, do you think you'll keep writing after the next two books are done? Like, do you think once that's all out? Who would know? Who would know? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I, I mean, I'm really, really fighting hard with the research for the revised edition of Life's Race Well Run. I'm, you know, I'm discovering so much about ancestors that I never ever knew before and I'm moving into that area where you start writing little stories based on the information that's there. Yeah. So it's going to be a labour of love for the next oh well it'll be twelve months because it won't be it'll be this time next year that it, I'll send it to you. Yeah. And then who knows what comes out of that. I mean you just said to me a few minutes ago, why not write the story of Cartland Couture? Well <laughs> <laughs> I mean I might Sure that, rocks. Well, I, might, I might chew that over for a while and who knows. But um, um, there are some things in my writing file, which is on the right-hand side of the desk where I chuck rubbish. Yeah. There's a half-finished novel called John Gavin's Days, which is a historical, accurately no novel mm -hmm. about the first boy ever hung in Western Australia in 1843. Huh. I reversed that to create mm -hmm. Gavin Johns and I told exactly the same story a mm -hmm. hundred years on in the Gavin Johns story. Okay. So I could go back to that and finish that now that I've got much more resources to depend upon. Yeah. And I've got a couple of other little things floating around, you know, that that are chapters or half chapters or things that I've just thought I'll 
God, Jeff, this isn't going anywhere. Get rid of it. Mm. And, it, and it, you might go back there and revisit them. But who knows? I mean, yeah. there's a lot of stuff still to be done. There are rocking horses to be built. <laughs> rocking horses to rock. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've just um, bought all the machinery to build a rocking horse. Oh, have you? Yeah, I imported the plans from England. I bought all the machinery, band saws and mitre saws, and I've converted one half of my garage now that I don't have to have two cars in the garage. Yeah. And I've set it all up there, and it's only a matter of me. I've even got the timber. It's only yeah. a matter of me making the first cut, and I'll be away on a rocking horse adventure. Oh, good for you. <laughs> I love rocking horses, as you can see. Rocking, from rocking horse, horse riding. Rider. Indeed, indeed. Oh, good on you. You're just so creative. Mad. I think mad is the word. No, 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 no. You're creative. You, you make things. But what you said about having manuscripts, that you, stories that you start and then you just don't go on with them, I think yep. every artist has that. They have canvases that they start and then they put them aside because they're not going where they want them to and they don't know how to make them do what they want them to. Correct. So I think I think every artist has something, some projects they abandon and they stay abandoned forever and for good reason. And then sometimes in 10 years' time, they go back and they pull it out and they think, oh, now I know what to do with this or... I get rid of that bit and we take it this way. So, you know, that stuff. Do you remember the massive, to, do you yeah. remember the massive headmaster thing that you did for me that had to be published in 10 by, oh, 10 yeah, by yeah, 7 yeah. because it was so yeah. big? Yeah. Well, that took a year to write, research and write. That there all? are, there are four other headmasters at Hale School who followed him. I mean, that could be a series. I'm not suggesting I'm going to do it. No. But that you, could be a series, you know, of, because you could do all 20th century headmasters and what they did and how the school changed and developed. It'd be boring as anything for anybody other than Hale do. School people. Yeah, but and there's descendants. a possibility that I've thought about and, uh, you know, I have no real intention of doing, but, mm. you know, it's it's there. And I think, too, you would need to be passionate about those other four headmasters. Which I'm not. No. Because none of them, except one, yeah. the last one in the 20th century, who was my headmaster, who virtue you know he was he so encouraged me with the plays yeah he virtually financed them wow and you know he even created a drama department for me and gave me a drama department budget after three or four of them wow. and you know he was just fantastic but he wrote his own book on his own headmastership called young oh, hearts okay. run free right. so you you wouldn't visit revisit that again but no. uh, you know it, it's interesting and none of them had the the insights or the power and the intelligence and the f and the you know it takes a lot of courage and fight to do what frederick charles faulkner did he yeah he was a great man and he yeah. deserved a great story and again how many people would have known his story before that came out yeah yeah not many not me not that's many. for sure <laughs> no no well jeff look Thank you for your time today. And thank you very much for allowing me to have this opportunity. You've been listening to an Indymosh interview with Jeff Hopkins. If you'd like to learn more about Jeff or check out some of his books, then visit indymosh.com.au or search for his books at your favourite online retailer. I'm Jenny Mosher. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.